started. So if we could have everyone settle. We want to get started right on time so that everyone has an opportunity to ask their questions or give in their comments. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. Could we please settle? Please make yourselves comfortable. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Tyre. I am the mayor of the city of Pittsfield, and I'll just be doing some very brief welcoming remarks and opening this session. I'd like to welcome all of you to Pittsfield's Rest of River Community Forum. The city of Pittsfield is pleased to be a part of this landmark partnership that through mutual commitments by all parties has resolved a 20 year long journey between GE and EPA. With this settlement agreement, we will embark on a comprehensive, faster, and more protective cleanup of the Housatonic River. And the river will be restored for present and future generations to enjoy, while minimizing the disruption to Pittsfield's neighborhoods. Additionally, the agreement will result in the cleanup of an additional 22 residential properties in Pittsfield and establish multiple investments that will support the ongoing revitalization and rebuilding of our city, in particular along the Tyler Street area and nearby the William Stanley Business Park. We will also have opportunities for future economic development initiatives in Pittsfield. As a whole, this settlement agreement symbolizes a collaborative effort that has resulted in a very real and viable solution toward the restoration of one of Berkshire County's most prized natural gems. Our primary focus for this evening will be on the elements of the settlement that are specific to Pittsfield. I'd like to just take a really quick snapshot so would you please raise your hand if you are a Pittsfield resident? Oh, welcome Pittsfielders, thank you for coming out this evening. Now I can see that there are people here who are objecting to the landfill and possibly other elements of the settlement agreement. Peaceful protests are a vital part of our democracy and your right to protest is welcome here this evening. Your right to protest must be balanced with the rights of others who came here tonight to learn more about the settlement and in particular the provisions that relate to Pittsfield. So can we please agree at the outset of our evening together that first and foremost Pittsfielders who have questions or comments about how this cleanup affects them their neighborhoods and their city ought to have the opportunity to raise those questions and concerns without interruption. When that portion of the session has concluded, we will certainly open the floor to anyone who wishes to speak on other matters, including the location of the landfill. So at this time, I'm going to invite Steve Pagnotta, the city's attorney, who will very briefly describe some of the ground rules for this evening and get us started on our presentation. Thank you.
Good evening. As the mayor indicated, good evening. As the mayor indicated, the primary purpose of tonight's meeting is to present an overview of Pittsfield's specific portions of the settlement agreement and to provide information on a cleanup to occur in Pittsfield and to explain the opportunities residents will have to participate in the cleanup process and steps being taken to minimize the impact on residential areas. We're hoping to provide residents of Pittsfield with opportunities to learn about the settlement process and to ask questions that specific about the process and how it will specifically impact them. As the mayor indicated, uh, please be respectful and allow the presenters and members of the public when called on to speak without interruptions. Uh, we have uh, provided cards for questions and Jim McGrath, who's in the back, this tall fellow there, uh, if anybody has additional questions they would like to have him pick up on their cards, uh, please look for him and he will, he will grab them from you. Uh, we'll bundle similar questions together so that we don't uh, repeat uh, the questions and that we can do this efficiently. Uh, if we have enough time, uh, we'll give everybody, an people who want to, an opportunity uh, to make statements and to ask questions. If you're making a statement, we ask that you limit your time to five minutes to give others opportunities to speak as well. Uh, this meeting has been scheduled for two hours. Uh, we believe we can accomplish what we need to do tonight in that time frame. There will be other opportunities in the future uh, for information, for questions, and for raising objections. Uh, the agenda tonight uh, will consist first of presentations. Uh, we'll, lead, we'll start off with EPA with Dean Tagliaferro and Brian Olson. Uh, we'll follow a presentation by Jane Wynn from BEAT. Uh, Mass Audubon uh, will, with Becky Cushing and Tom uh, Lotzenheiser uh, will address us as well. Uh, Deanna Rufer from the city uh, and Jeff Cook uh, will also address us this evening. Um, after that, uh, I'll read uh, so the submitted questions uh, and the appropriate uh, person uh, will respond to them. Uh, and as I said, if we have some time before the time is up, uh, we will uh, have an opportunity for public comment and questions. Again, we'll give priority uh, to those who have questions about Pittsfield and if there's time, address um, uh, other issues or other concerns uh, that folks may have. Uh, with that, uh, I will invite the Dean uh, from EPA to address us. Thank you, Steve. Um, my name is Dean Taliaferro. I've been the EPA project manager at this site for about 20 years now. Um, Excuse me. I wanted to give a little bit of background on how we got here. I'll try to go through this quickly, but it has been a long process, but it leads up to how and why we're here talking about rest of the river. So in 2000, that started EPA's major role here. There was the 2000 consent decree. It prescribed cleanup at most of the facility in Pittsfield and other properties. There was also a separate cleanup of 200 residential properties under the state mass DEP program. And it also included a, a settlement for what's called natural resource damages or damages to the environment, which was a cash payment by GE and some other obligations. Specifically in Pittsfield, there's been a tremendous amount of work done in the last 20 years. There's been about 20 different actual cleanup operations and the consent decree specified the remedy for these, which I'll talk about later, is different than rest the river, which we're here for tonight. 
Um, the first one, so like I said, there's been a lot of work done, starting with Allendale School. It's been a long time, but the first cleanup was removing 40,000 cubic yards of contaminated fill out of that property. And then the most recent cleanup was around Silver Lake and up at Uncommit Brook, and those just completed in the last couple of years. This is also just, just a different view and aerial. One thing I want to point out, this is, well, since we're talking about the river here, this first stretch of the river adjacent to E Street, adjacent to EPA's facility, that's where we started the river cleanup. There's extremely high levels of contamination there, um, much, much greater than what is down in what we call rest of the river. That was done in, from 2000 to 2002. And then the next stretch, although this isn't the best map, was the mile and a half reach, which starts up at Lyman Street and goes down to Fred Garner Park. Just a few things on that. Like I said, the first half mile, since that was next to the source, had PCBs in the range of 100 parts per million, uh, which had to be removed. This stretch being the next stretch down was about 40 parts per million. I know those numbers don't mean much, but it's more just context that as you go downstream, the contamination gets slightly lower in each stretch. So we finished the cleanup at Fred Garner Park, and we believe it was very successful. It reduced the contamination in the surface sediments by over 99% to much less than one part per million. Along with the cleanup, there was a significant economic development package as part of the 2000 consent decree, separate from this agreement, which has some other uh, economic benefits for the city. There was $10 million to the city, over $15 million to PETA. De uh, demolition at GE's cost of numerous buildings that were followed by the transfer of 52 acres to PETA. Um, some other items that were also in there was the landscaping, the construction of Bellinger Field, the very heavy. Park in the city. Sorry. Um, and leases for. Buildings and office space for PETA. Uh, the estimated value for the whole thing was about 60 to $70 million to the city. So the rest of the river, yeah, thank you. Is that better? So for the rest of the river, uh, I briefly mentioned the consent decree in 2000 specified the actual cleanup. So there, there was no follow on proposed cleanup. But for rest of the river, the parties decided on a, on a process, not the outcome. Um, so EPA did an extensive decade long investigation with peer reviews, evaluated options, did a feasibility study viewed various options for both cleanup and removal of the material and final disposal. We issued a cleanup plan in 2014, and then after public comment, um, issued the final cleanup plan. Just a few things on that. Uh, the feasibility study included, like I said, a wide range of options from no action to very, very extensive sediment and floodplain removal. It also looked at five options to dispose of the material, assuming some would be removed. And those options, which went through an engineering analysis, included local disposal, offsite disposal, two innovative technologies, thermal desorption, and chemical extraction. And Based on that, EPA, under the regulations, has to follow a set of criteria and select the best plan that meets this criteria. And just some of the criteria, without getting into too much details, is clearly protection of human health and the environment is most important, but also factors including short-term impacts, implementability, and cost. That all has to be weighed, and EPA has to follow that and do a detailed analysis of that. So we did that, we proposed our permit. What we proposed, what we issued as the final permit 
had removal of about 900,000 cubic yards of material, and we selected, after public comment, off-site disposal. That was subject, under these regulations, uh, to people who could file appeals, and they did. Five parties filed appeals. General Electric appealed everything, the cleanup, the disposal, um, pretty much every element in that plan. Four other parties thought we didn't, three other parties thought we didn't have enough cleanup, wanted more cleanup, and another party also wanted a little less cleanup. So these appeals go to what's called an environmental appeals board. It's a series of three administrative judges. They reviewed our record, how it matched up with the criteria, do we do our analysis correctly. They upheld everything on the cleanup, action, the sediment removal, the basic removal. However, they did not concur with EPA's decision to send this material off-site. So they did not approve it, so we could not go forward with that, despite we thought we put an excellent case out there, but it didn't prevail. So we had two options. We could go forward and come up with a new plan on our own and also potentially go through more litigation or alternatively at the same time try to reach a mediated settlement that would um, allow us to move forward in a, in a manner where we get some certainty and get, th and get this cleanup moving. So that's what we did. And when, when EPA entered this, our, our objectives were, were pretty clear. To get the highest level, most contaminated material off-site, get additional cleanup, since we're, we're doing some mediation, we, we want to have a better cleanup, more PCBs out of the river, absolutely ensure protection of, of, of human health and the environment, try to avoid litigation or reduce the risk of litigation and start design activities now because right now everybody's in limbo and, that, and the environment, you know, it's not getting any cleaner and the risks are still there and we just feel it's time to get, to get started on this cleanup. So the first part is what do you do with the material that comes out of the river? We proposed, like I said, or we didn't propose, we decided and, and went with off-site disposal of all the material, regardless of the concentration of PCBs in that material. That didn't prevail. GE wanted everything disposed of locally. And we pushed very hard and were successful in getting the highest concentration of PCBs to be taken off-site with an absolute minimum of 100,000 yards leaving the state. The remaining material, it will go in um, a local disposal area in a double line secure landfill in the area at, near Woods Pond in Lee. For the material that is going to be placed in that landfill, we estimate the overall concentrations, the average concentrations will be in about the 20 to 25 parts per million range. And there's extensive requirements in this agreement for air sampling, groundwater monitoring, inspections, maintenance, both prior to construction of the landfill for a baseline of data, during, and after in perpetuity. So as uh, Mayor Tyre said, this one of the primary objectives of this presentation um, is to focus on what's going to happen in Pittsfield. So a lot of it is both what's the change in the permit, but also a refresher of what was in the original permit, because that, that's the significant amount of work that's in Pittsfield. So this, this figure over here, which there's a poster of outside, and I know it's, it's very busy, but this is the f there's five miles of the river in Pittsfield, and it goes by three fairly densely populated neighborhoods off Pomeroy, very close to where we are right now, uh, the Anita Drive neighborhood, and the Polo Grounds here. And it goes all the way down to the town line. So there's a fair amount of excavation and remediation in Pittsfield. Um, that was in the original permit. So none of that has changed. What, what was achieved was getting additional cleanup. If there was going to be cleanup on some of the residential par properties that are fairly small and actually extend into the river or very close, we felt that if there was going to do a cleanup, that it should be sufficient to um, 
eliminate any need for, for further use restrictions or concerns. The original permit did require those parcels to be cleaned to what we'd call a, a safe level, but more for recreational use. This just eliminates any, any um, issues going forward. And then Canoe Meadows, another major part of this project up here. Again, there was cleanup required. We increased the amount because there's a lot of usage with trails, a lot of educational activities there. And we locked in um, requirements for GE to mitigate when there is work on this property, how that parcel can still be used, the other areas of the parcel by creating alternate parking, alternate trails, um, a lot of other uh, opportunities so that that parcel can be used throughout uh, the cleanup. A couple other ones that are a little, little specific that are a lot of these banks, as you know, the river is very dynamic. It likes to meander back and forth and create er erosion. The original plan um, had a little bit of work about trying to prevent erosion. This just, it provides more options to do an engineering study to see if we can reduce some erosion, which would prevent potential PCBs from recontaminating the river. And then also options on cleaning sensitive areas like vernal pools. So it gave us more tools going forward. Downstream of Pittsfield, there, there are some other enhancements, so I'll just briefly touch on those. A lot of the areas, there's six dams downstream of Pittsfield, so a lot of those areas are impoundments behind the dams. There's going to be additional sediment removal, and there'll be sufficient sediment removal to eliminate two, to and G's required to remove two dams. One was a major dam up here at Columbia Mill, a former paper mill, and one at Eagle Mill down here um, as you get into late. The other thing that the city and EPA worked very hard on uh, was, was, again, formalizing or locking in or making firm commitments, both from EPA to the city and from GE to both of us, to minimize the impacts of these neighborhoods. We've heard over and over again, you know, it is fairly, it's, it, it's a big construction project, so there's going to be impacts, and we need to work with everybody to minimize that. So there's going to be several opportunities, and the city can talk about this later, Deanna will talk about it later, for the city to have input, the residents to have input, neighborhood groups to have input, such as where are the staging areas going to go? Where, what truck roads are you going to use? Just briefly right now, and I know there's a lot of questions on that, and it's a little frustrating, the actual truck routes, the staging areas, the actual methods of all this work, it's not finalized. It hasn't been decided. That will come in work plans to be submitted by GE in the future that EPA will review and approve. But before we do that, we have committed and the mayor and the city and the towns have insisted that they be given an opportunity to review and provide significant input on that. So I realize, and I've seen some of the questions already, where are the staging areas? Is it next to my house? We don't know that yet. Can you use rail? We're looking at the option of using rail. There's obviously a rail, yard, rail line that goes right by that. It might be feasible. There's pluses and minuses to that. So I just, I just want to emphasize, although there's no decision made yet, there's going to be plenty of opportunity for input for the residents, the community, and anybody else who wants to look at these documents. Uh, one specific document is called Quality of Life, where we have to show how we're going to protect health and safety. You know, what's the noise of this operation going to be? What's the hours of operation? Is there going to be lights 24 hours a day in my backyard? How is all that going to happen? And those are design documents, and they're going to be very important. And we're going to reach out um, pretty much continuously throughout this project to do the best we can to get the, the work done that we need to do to protect the river and improve the biota and the fish while to the extent possible, minimize the impact to these neighborhoods. Um, as I mentioned in the, a little bit, in the feasibility study or the engineering analysis, when we talked about, all right, we got a lot, we got a million cubic yards, um, roughly, 
I know that's a, it's a strange unit, it's a tough thing to grasp. It's roughly, if you can picture a standard dump truck, that's like 100,000 dump trucks. So it's a lot of material. What are we gonna do with that material that's in the river and exposed to fish currently? So we looked at, like I said, off-site disposal, put it in a truck, drive it somewhere, put it in a landfill. We also looked at probably 10 or 12 innovative or alternative technologies screened out ones that didn't seem feasible, did a very detailed analysis of thermal desorption, which essentially heats the soil and sediment to drive the PCBs into the air phase, collect it, and then burn it. And we also looked at something called chemical extraction, where you add other chemicals, which is an obviously the best idea, to try and pull or draw those PCBs out. And like I mentioned, we had to evaluate against the criteria, and part of that criteria is cost, effectiveness, and adverse effects. And on balance, we thought the disposal offsite had less adverse effects, was less costly, and for this site, for this particular site, those two technologies were not appropriate. However, going forward, we will continue, we have been and we will continue to look at additional opportunities for research. And EPA, Brian especially, has worked very hard to secure commitments from EPA that we will solicit on our own, not through GE, opportunities for research institutions or businesses or vendors to come here and try and show us and see if they can find something that will work. Regardless of any of that works, Almost nowhere in a dynamic river system in place with sediment in place will these technologies work. So regardless, the material has to be dug up, dredged from the river, brought somewhere where a vendor can try this. So we don't really see a downside getting started to start the excavation, start the remediation, while at the same time reaching out to these vendors. And. Um, that, that's all I have, and next I think it's Jane from Beat. Thank you, Dean. Hi, I'm Jane Wynn from Berkshire Environmental Action Team, or Beat. And first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really important to have you involved and have you stay involved. I grew up on the banks of the Housatonic River, right down the street from here on the corner of Holmes and Pomeroy. I remember the river stank to high heaven growing up, and when you stuck a stick in the mud and wiggled it, you'd get brightly colored oil coming up in concentric circles. It was kind of pretty. I thought I was really good at catching frogs until I went to camp and realized it's really hard to catch a healthy frog. The frogs in our river had lost their startle response. I love this river and its floodplain. It was my playground growing up. I went on to get my master's degree in zoology, and most of Beat's board and staff have science degrees. And together, Beat feels that this settlement agreement is our best opportunity to have a much more thorough remediation to protect the environment for wildlife. Right now, the river is the unlined, uncapped toxic waste dump allowing PCBs to spread into your air, water, land, and up the food web. PCBs last virtually forever, and they're getting into everything. This agreement lets us get lots more toxic PCBs out of the river a lot faster. Do you know that mink can't breed along the section of the river down to Woods Pond because the PCBs are so poisonous to their young? And at these meetings, we've heard people talking about losing loved ones to cancer or experiencing cancer themselves. We need to get this toxic waste out of our river. This is our last chance to get GE to clean their mess out of our river. Let's get as much out as we possibly can the settlement eliminates dozens of acres of covering up or capping the toxic waste, and the settlement gets 100 acres more PCBs out of the river. The settlement requires GE to start immediately. GE will be taking thousands more samples and developing work plans that will be put out for public review. Take the time to take a look at what they're planning and comment on it. We can, and we have in the past, made the work plans better by public comment. 
With this agreement in place, we'll keep fighting to really hold EPA to offering these, um, to have alternative technologies come in and be tried out on our PCBs. Our PCBs have some of the most highly chlorinated PCBs around, so it's important to test them on our, our river. We need you to stay involved. Make EPA show us what technologies are out there that can be tried, and make sure these dumps, like the one proposed for Lee, are only temporary. We want these dumps cleaned up. EPA has committed to soliciting input and working with all stakeholders during the cleanup design process, so please, please, please stay involved, comment on everything going on, come to the Citizens Coordinating Council meetings, and make your voice heard. Thank you. And I think I, I hand it off to Tom or Becky, Mass Audubon. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Lotzenheiser. I'm Mass Audubon's Central Western Regional Scientist. I've um, been uh, out to the Housatonic many times. Canoe Meadows is one of, one of the sanctuaries where I'm responsible for trying to see what's wrong with it and make it better. And this whole PCB uh, situation has really been a challenge for me since I got involved in this around 2003. I've read the corrective measure study in 2000, and, well, the draft plan in 2007, and when it finally came out in 2010, thousands and thousands of papers, of pages uh, in these reports to try to understand what's going to happen to our sanctuary and to the rest of the river. And I sincerely believe that this uh, current settlement represents the best practicable path forward uh, for uh, many, many reasons. Mass Audubon's team of scientists, policy analysts, and educators have always advocated for a strenuous cleanup that removes as many PCBs from the environment as feasible and ensures uh, that a healthy e eco uh, Housatonic River ecosystem is restored. In this settlement, GE has agreed to a more thorough cleanup than the 2016 permit, allowed for robust public input into more detailed remediation plan components as they are developed, and will begin on the ground work in the rest of river area, hopefully without further litigation. Overall, we believe that this settlement represents the best practicable path for, through this environmental disaster, at long last setting real benchmarks for reducing the burden of PCBs on the Housatonic's human and natural communities. Throughout the mediation, we've also uh, reviewed the option of continued litigation. We believe that the risks involved in the litigation process including years of potential additional delay and the potential for worst case scenarios becoming real, outweigh any potential benefits over the current settlement. This agreement takes up to three high level PCB disposal facilities in the Housatonic Valley off the table. It also ensures that GE will not be able to simply walk away from a problem it created. Instead, through this agreement, we have secured extra remediation in the river and high use areas, including canoe meadows, out of state disposal for high level PCBs and additional compensation from GE for affected communities. These important improvements over the previous permit should result on balance in a better result for human health and the environment. Going forward, Mass Audubon stands ready to engage with GE and EPA and other stakeholders as work plans are developed and further studies undertaken to get this next phase of remediation underway. I hope that each of you will similarly strive to ensure that the highest standards of cleanup are planned and implemented here in the Housatonic community. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, um, I'm Becky Cushing. I'm the local sanctuary director for Mass Audubon's Berkshire Wildlife Sanctuaries. I live in Lennoxdale, and um, the the issue of the PCB cleanup and the the best um, path forward is by far the most challenging um, environmental problem that I've worked on my career. Um, so. Currently, we know that PCBs exist and move throughout the Housatonic River. And we also paddle the river. We live alongside the river. We bird the river. Um, and so we really, we know that we have to clean it up for the health of our community. We also know that the Housatonic River is one of our greatest natural resources. And it offers so many benefits to our community from the aesthetic beauty to outdoor recreation opportunities to stormwater management. But it harbors toxic materials. And those PCBs are moving throughout the food web. We have to remove them. The mediation process and the outcome were very far from perfect but the alternatives are so much worse. Just to give the example of um, Mass Audubon's Canoe Meadows Wildlife Sanctuary, we have a 250-acre um, natural area in Pittsfield that many of you have probably been to, um, and it will be impacted uh, for two years when it's used as a staging area for its own cleanup and cleanup of other areas. But we're committed to working with all the parties to clean up Canoe Meadows, but also keep it open during the remediation so the 10,000 plus visitors that use it every year can continue to do so. We're also committed to holding GE and the EPA accountable, not only during the remediation, but also during the restoration. And we also will hold GE and the EPA to the highest standards of landfill design, operation, and monitoring. And you heard Dean use the words earlier in perpetuity, and that's a really important aspect of this cleanup. We're going to remain involved long after the work has been completed because we have to make sure the PCBs do not re-enter the environment. And we'll continue to advocate for the use of alternative technologies. We support the commitment and the agreement to current and future technologies, pilot studies, and the adaptive management requirement. I think we all know that the plan is only the beginning. We're talking about quality of life um, plans, access agreements, lots of aspects of the work that has yet to be decided and um, is not e has not even started yet. And we all need to be involved in that process. We have to acknowledge that it took us um, more than 40 years for, to come to this agreement and it allows us to finally take a step forward. But we really do need to work together to ensure that we can continue to move forward. I think if there's one thing that we can agree on in this room, it's that we do want a healthy future for the river and for future generations so that they can live and work alongside the river without fear of its contamination. All of the environmental groups, the EPA, the representatives, the residents of Lee, Lennox, Lennoxdale, Stockbridge, Great Barrington, and Sheffield, the city of Pittsfield, NGE, and all of you will need to work together to restore a healthy river ecosystem. Thank you for being here tonight. Hi, I'm, De I'm Deanna Roofer, and I just want to uh, touch on a few of the reasons why the city participated in this mediation process and the community benefits that we um, believe are a result of the settlement. And um, 
Uh, some of these have been mentioned previously, but I'd just like to go through them again. Um, and the first is to the resolution of the uncertainty about the river, which is in our backyards. Um, and this project allows that the um, cleanup to go forward uh, in a timely manner. And the second, what was very important to us, was ensuring that we um, minimize the, um, the impacts to the residential streets that back onto the river. Um, and in, in that area in particular, there are uh, over a dozen streets which we have gotten the commitment from uh, General Electric that uh, they will be used to the minimum extent possible in terms of the cleanup process. Um, and I can uh, give you those if you're interested to know which streets those are. Um, um, I, oh, I mean, yeah, I'm supposed to be going ahead of my slides. Um, I appreciate the question, and, and we would ask you, if you can, to write that down. But we, we with you, are going to be defining what minimum means uh, as the work plans are put together. Um, and uh, the minimum means that, uh, in some cases, a material may be put through backyards or along the river rather than uh, across the streets. In addition with the streets, we've gotten an agreement from General Electric to repair any damage done to our streets and, uh, with a methodology for identifying what damage is done um, for, through this process. We also obtained a, a commitment that as was done at Fred Garner Park, that after the cleanup area is completed, that General Electric will work with us to, um, uh, to develop recreational enhancements along the river. And one example could be, if the neighborhood uh, wants it and agrees with us that it has value, we own a property behind Joseph Drive that butts onto the river. Uh, that might be a place where we could establish a canoe launch in the future. Again, we anticipate the neighborhood will be brought into that process. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, we obtained um, an additional contribution to the economic development fund that the city has had for the last 20 years, uh, and an economic development fund that has helped fund everything from the creation of new jobs in the city to the renovation of the Colonial Theater. Uh, and we, the last time around, received 10 million for that. Um, and so that funds will be able to be used to the benefit of the city through very public processes. So going to the next slide, um, what was another point that was very important to the city in this process was to make sure that we opened up a uh, more active conversation with General Electric about the properties and the buildings that they still have in our community uh, and w w what steps would be taken and in a timely manner to address the vacant properties that exist in our city. And to that, um, to that point, General Electric has agreed that the property that is on the south side of E Street, that they will remove the barbed wire um, and other th uh, features like the employee turnstiles, and they will continue to landscape that area as they had done uh, adjacent to the ball field. In terms of the property that is bounded by the railroad tracks, Merrill Road and um, New York Avenue and Tyler Street and the property that was turned over to the Pittsfield Economic Development Authority, there would be the, again the removal of the barbed wire, removal of abandoned structures like the pipe trussel and exterior vents and stacks and painting and refurbishing this so that we don't have another 10 to 20 or more years in our in our community of peeling paint uh, and broken windows. Uh, the GE will also meet semi-annually with us. And this is, um, while they have been here and we have had periodic discussions, we have never had a scheduled time in, of, of meetings to specifically talk about what will happen in the, as we move forward with their uh, properties in our community. This is something working with the neighborhood surrounding there that has always been a challenge for us. And so by scheduling semi-annual meetings, we hope that becomes less of a challenge and we are cooperatively working 
uh, towards the betterment of our neighborhoods and our community. Going to the next one. Um, we also uh, wanted to negotiate in there the potential for the transfer of some of their property. Along Tyler Street, there's three parking lots which have sat with um, chain link fences around them for 20 years now. And uh, what we have asked for and gained uh, agreement from General Electric is that they will remove the fencing and the paving and the guardrails and they will seed and landscape those. And even more so, they will um, consider the transfer of those properties to the city so that we can see them redeveloped and become a productive part of our neighborhoods. And then there's a property bounded by Woodlawn Avenue and Kellogg Street, uh, which was not a part of the property that was turned over to the Petsfield Economic Development Authority. Uh, they agreed with that property as well to discuss with both the city and PETA, who has their offices currently on that property, uh, to transfer those so that they can be put back into productive use. So these are very important to our Tyler Street neighborhood. Uh, but very important to us as a community as a whole to begin to continue to move beyond the years of uh, General Electric's um, business here. Then finally, as has been mentioned, there are uh, many questions that have not yet been um, answered and cannot be answered because the work plans for the actual cleanup have not been completed. And we wanted to make sure that the city and the neighborhoods had an active role in that. And not only has EPA committed to that, but General Electric has as well. And that uh, goes from the plan that's called the quality of life, that to us is what's gonna happen? How are we gonna be impacted as this uh, cleanup is happening? What is gonna be the noise? What is gonna be the traffic that is caused? And how are we going to avoid those? And how are we going to make sure that there's a balance in uh, consideration between the need to remove the materials and the need to uh, allow our residents to continue to have a quality of life at their homes. Um, and so this work and the traffic routing will be coordinated and I would ask you all to stay involved and we will be adding a section to the city's website where we will put all the documents and we will be actively engaging and communicating with you as residents as we go forward. And you can expect it's going to take months, possibly a year, before we actually see any substantive work happening. But that, um, uh, that, uh, that during that time, we'll have a lot of opportunity for more conversations. And I do want to go back to one point that I missed, which is the 22 properties, uh, which will be cleaned up to residential standards. All of those property owners have received a letter from EPA uh, with contact information also for the city so that you know that in fact your property is scheduled for uh, a more extensive cleanup and, and you can learn about what that means uh, over the next couple of months, few months. Um, and finally, as I've mentioned, the roads would be repaired uh, um, uh, once um, uh, uh, the remediation is completed. And so that's really, in a, a nutshell, why the city felt that this was in our best interest and ours being both the city as a whole and you as the residents that are affected by this. We felt it really gave us an opportunity to put behind us uh, this cleanup so that the river can then be an asset to us as we go forward um, and leave our homes to our future generations and also uh, um, can uh, have an active participation in it, which under uh, different approaches we might not have. And with that, I believe um, Jeff Cook, um, you were going to come on up and say a few comments as another party of standing in this uh, process. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Cook. I am a 50-year resident of Pittsfield. Uh, during those 50 years, except for the first two, I have either kayaked or canoed on this river. The last 30 years, I live along the floodplain. Um, I, I live on Palomino Drive. I live along the floodplain that is going to be 
excavated and cleaned up. And so I have been one of the doubters about the ability to clean up the river and the floodplain and not destroy them in the process. So when you heard about one party who was looking for less cleanup, I am that party. I have to say that for those of us who live along the river, who will have the equipment and the dredging and the 100,000, a million, how many truckloads of stuff are going through there, there's a very different concern than many of you who are here tonight have, which is the uncertainty. When the community begins to see the extent of the cleanup for the properties that abut it, those people who have the benefit of owning those properties are going to have one interesting hard time selling their home when the time comes. And for those who live further down the river, once this process is beginning, for that whole time until your property is passed, that uncertainty continues. Until we got into this mediation, the city of Pittsfield had not had a chance to stand up for those of us who live in Pittsfield and Lenox along the river to have a quality of life plan. Those people who were pushing the cleanup, many of them have not been able to stand where I stand and say, what kind of equipment is going in that area? And how long is that going to happen? And what's going to be left? And what will we experience? It's a very, very big deal. So thanks to the mayor and Deanna and the people at EPA, there is now a focus on something that everybody who lives along the river needs to think about. It's a very big issue. And for those people who have been pushing very hard for a cleanup, never have they considered what those of us who are what I call ground zero will experience and for how long. It's the city, it's EPA, and now it's, it's GE. It's something to keep in mind. The other thing that's really important is to talk about truth and facts. And to recognize that Peter, peanut butter in the wrong concentration can be harmful. The amount of concentration in the property that is being planned to landfill is not a toxic dump and it's not a risk. It bothers me that we have the air filled with these concerns when we have a test site in Pittsfield right near the Allendale School called Hill 78 that has existed for 15 years. I hear you for 15 years without a problem because it's protected. This I is said the vets do it. Don't you remember me? Yeah. You don't remember me? Yeah. Yeah, I went in and took the soil samples out of the schoolyard when the mayor said, with 800 people on a petition, that we're not going to test it. 35 years ago, I've been pushing this. And so has Tiff. Don't get up and say there's no problem with Hill 78, my friend. It's <laughs> Yeah. It's on. It sits on. It sits on. It sits on. 
aquifers. Do you know that? Yeah. Glacial aquifers that have been destroyed by PCBs. Yeah, I really the think... The reason why Pittsfield has reservoirs for drinking water is because the aquifers, right. glacial, ancient aquifers have been polluted. Listen, we've sacrificed the river, the aquifers, the floodplain. The biggest IG zone in the county is sacrificed. We can't do anything with it. You can't build on it. People have sacrificed their lives working with this yeah. stuff. You're living next to a river. I hate to say this. It's the most polluted river, almost the most polluted on the planet. Because well, it's, it's a fact. I know you're not going to be bothered by facts. I know you're not going to let the facts get in your way. The most documented river on the planet as far as PCBs go. Listen to it. Wrap the head around it. It's the most Thank documented you. river on the planet. So please, don't tell please take a seat. what needs to be done. I will. Please take a seat. But when you start talking, please, 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 take, please take a seat. You'll have an opportunity later. Very important. Thank you. The last thing I, the, the, I, I, want, to, I want to say about this uh, is that it, it's really going to be important what you call bullshit and, and what the facts are for people to deal with, which, by the way, is going to happen. All right. And so I just want to say that I've been involved, I've been involved with this and working on this for 22 years. I have dealt extensively with the people at EPA. I have had many arguments with some of them, and I really strongly believe that they are totally dedicated to addressing all the issues and that they speak the truth and work very hard for the people of Berkshire County. And I think it's very, very important that they be treated with respect and be given the opportunity to do the work that they know how to do better than anybody else. Thank you. Um, so we'll open up this up for some questions shortly. Uh, So, so we'll answer questions. Uh, let me just finish the, um, what the, this is important, I think, to everyone, what the next steps are. Um, we got our steps. So, uh, we plan on, what we, EPA has agreed to as part of this agreement is to translate the agreement into a cleanup proposal, which will come out by uh, Memorial Day. The, it will be in the form of a draft permit We'll have public hearing. This is not EPA's meeting. Um, we will have an EPA public hearing. We have uh, public informational meetings prior to that hearing. And then we'll um, accept public comments for at least 45 days, probably longer, a minimum of 45 days. So um, we will then take a look at the public comments. We will respond to every single public comment and then we will make a final decision likely by the end of the calendar year. So that's the, that's the process, okay? So EPA has a public process that we want to go through. We want to hear comments. We want to hear everyone's comments throughout that process, and then we'll make a final decision. So we can open... What's that? Questions now? Thank you. Um, before we start questions, I want to I'm trying to overcome an oversight of mine, which is to uh, thank some of the people who came here this evening. We have members of the city council here tonight. Uh, we have Channing Gibson from Le from Lennox, uh, Pat Carlino from Lee, and Renee Wood from Sheffield, and we also have uh, former Mayor Doyle. 
uh, from uh, Pittsfield. Um, so I'm going to start with some of these questions. Um, I have a stack of them. We're not going to be able to get through them all this evening. Uh, there is, um, if you have further questions, uh, please contact anybody from uh, the EPA or city, and we'll be happy to take the time to answer them uh, personally. Um, So, uh, the uh, first question is, uh, what's the timeline for remediation? What's the timeline for remediation? Nobody asked that question. So, so um, based on the, the, the uh, assuming that um, we go through a process and whatever the disposal um, option is, at the end of the process, there are design documents that have to be done. So we're talking probably two years before we start doing any kind of cleanup. We, uh, there'll be lots of sampling that'll occur, and especially in Pittsfield, there'll be sampling in, on these residential properties and on Audubon's property and everything. Um, and then follow that up with two to three years probably we'll, we'll be into the river doing some sort of cleanup. So that's, that's what we expect. It's, a, it's potentially a 13 year process. Why is this settlement not part of the consent decree? Uh, since, it, it's, since it's not, how will it be enforced? This settlement, um, is, it's true that it's not part of this uh, consent decree. What I was talking about earlier in terms of next steps, that ties it back into the consent decree. Basically, EPA has agreed in this settlement to take the cleanup parts of the settlement, put it into a proposal, and then put it out for public comment. That puts it right back into the consent decree. So I agree that it's not part of the consent decree specifically, but ultimately it's going to be back part of the consent decree. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Brian Olson from EPA. I'm the director of the Superfund program at EPA. Uh, what other alternatives were looked at to clean up the river, such as the science of bioremediation, and why was thermal de desorption deemed not appropriate for this cleanup? Dean may have already uh, answered that in his presentation. We did, um, if you want to look at the corrective measure study, it's online, EPA's corrective measure study. There was um, a series of alternatives we looked at. There's an in-depth evaluation of each alternative. And as Dean said, we, we the, the law, um, has us look at eight criteria, um, and, there are, and th they range from protectiveness to cost, cost effectiveness or cost and um, short-term effectiveness and things like that. So we have to go through each criteria and sort of uh, weigh those things. So we did that in the corrective measure study. In terms of thermal desorption, it was there. It's about, uh, you know, off-site disposal um, was about $200 million more than on-site disposal. Thermal desorption was about $200 million more than that. So the court that we, the, the Environmental Appeals Board that we went to that questioned this, they, that, that was part of what they were questioning was the cost. So um, it, it was partly due to cost. Again, thermal desorption, for those of you that don't know, what it actually does is it heats up. You have to take the material out of the river, first of all. You, you have to put it in a massive location um, to, so that you have enough room to work. Pile the dirt up, you know, maybe three or four feet. Heat it up, put a cover, using, you know, huge amounts of energy. Heat it up, put a cover over it, and make sure because when you heat it up, there's going to be emissions coming from. There's going to be volatile, the, the PCBs will be volatilized. You have to put a cover over it. You need to make sure that cover doesn't leak because all the PCBs are coming out of that all at once um, and going into a system that will ultimately destroy the PCBs. So there's no perfect solution as I think most of you know um, and that was one of the ones that we looked at closely. Sounds great. To save DE money. 
save money on the permit. Well, uh, you know, the law that we have to abide by that Congress put in place yeah. has cost as a factor. That's not, yeah. that's not GE's fault. GE could agree to just do it anyway. I, I agree with you there, but they didn't. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what level of effort and resources will be implemented to restore the natural flow of the river, oxbows, meanders, et cetera? Will the river be channelized as it was through the center of Pittsfield? The river will not be channelized. Um, this may be, for, for the engineering people, one of the hardest parts of the job because we want to make the river look like it looks now as much as possible when we're done. So the restoration um, the actual digging in the river to make sure that we don't create more erosion. We'd like to keep it as natural as possible. So no, it won't be channelized. Pittsfield was already channelized before we started, so we didn't, we didn't do that through the cleanup. Um, but we're gonna try to make it look like it looks right now. That's the goal. It's one of, you know, that, the river, despite the fact that it has PCBs in it, most of you know this is one of the most beautiful sections of river between here and Woods Pond or even down further than any place in New England or, or, or beyond. So we want to make it after, it's going to take a few years to, for it to restore, but we want to make it look like it does now. What percentage of all PCBs in the river will this proposal cleanup actually remove? Um, so we, that, that's actually a hard question to answer because I've, I've answered every question that people have asked for the last two public meetings, so I will try to answer it. It's hard to answer because, and, and for those of you that uh, do work in the environmental field, when we clean up sites, whether it be PCBs or other contaminants, there is a level by which we say is okay. It's not a, you know, there is, there's no such thing as um, no PCBs or no, uh, you know, no lead, no whatever. We find it, especially at this site, right, because PCBs, <laughs> there were so many PCBs produced um, at the plant itself. So there are areas, there are vast, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of acres in the floodplain that will clean up to, let's say, one part per million or five parts per million, whatever the safe level is we have in our permit. And so if you added those up, there's going to be PCBs left in the system, but those are perfectly safe. And then there are other... And then there are other, uh, other areas where we're capping PCBs in place in the river that it, you know, we can make safe, but I would say those are the PCBs that we would include in a calculation of PCBs left in the system. Those are PCBs that we are leaving in the system. Well, now there are safe PCBs and too. Like there, are, there, are safe PCBs. there are safe levels of PCBs, yes. There are safe levels of PCBs. Uh, where will the staging areas be and for how many years will this project be active in Pittsfield? Um, I think as Dean said, we, we don't know where the, uh, the staging areas will be yet. We're going to try to put them in places where they have little impact on people. I mean, we've talked to Canoe Meadows about using their site or parts of their site um, where we're going to have to clean up anyway. and so. We don't know exactly where, but I, I would say the, the entire project in Pittsfield is probably about five years. What steps are being taken to ensure that the contaminated material, when it's being transported, won't spill onto the roads? Um, so the, the material, uh, this is... This is, just remember what we're talking about, this is sediments and soils that are existing in the floodplain right now. We will, whether, whether it's the higher levels that will be taken out of state or the lower levels, we'll put them in either a dump truck or a rail car, depending on what we end up using. They'll be covered um, with some kind of a plastic covering system. What about uh, what's that? What about leakage? They, The garbage trucks definitely leak. I know they do in my neighborhood. Um, it, the, 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 
what we would put on the top of these dump trucks would not be just that similar tarp that you see in some of the regular construction trucks. It would be something that covers the entire thing. Oh, they'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll be sealed to dump trucks. These aren't your regular, everyday, 50-year-old dump trucks that are going to be used. The, remember, so PCBs aren't, and, and, and uh, hopefully everyone understands this, PCBs aren't acutely hazardous. They are chronically hazardous. So when we look at PCB risk, we look at people's exposure over 20 or 30 years. So we're, for, I think all, we all agree on this, we're more concerned with the PCBs that are sitting in the river or in ba people's backyards or in the floodplain than we are once they get in a dump truck and they're going to where they're going, okay? Because, and if a dump truck, let's say we got the question before, well, what happens if a dump truck tips over uh, on the way to wherever it's going? Whether it be going out of state or in state, it doesn't matter. If a dump truck tipped over, I would, I as an environmental person who've been doing this for 30 years, I would be worried more about the diesel fuel in that dump truck than the PCBs in the dump truck. Much worse much worse environmental issue. We're worried about cumulative. I, I agree. I agree. That's exactly why we want to get it out of the river. That's exactly why we want to get it out of the river. Why do you want to poison two neighborhoods when you take it out of the river? Look, I will answer that question. I, two clean neighborhoods. I, I live in, in, um, in, in Westwood, Massachusetts right now. There's a, there's a site that um, we've worked on um, in Norwood, Massachusetts, which is right next door. It's not far from my house. Um, where where we, EPA ended up capping the entire, it's called Norwood PCBs is the name of the site. Um, we capped the entire site. We ended up putting, or we didn't, developers put, um, uh, and there were lots of, there was lots of public interest, put, um, uh, either a workout world or one of those gy big gym on the site. There's actually vapor intrusion systems in the buildings. There's a Monkey Sports, which is a massive sports um, um, retail store, on sitting on top of this site. So, I, this is about the the, the 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 fact that we're putting. What when we put this material in this site in Lee, it's going to be. It's going to be a lot more safe in, in terms of what EPA does. We've done it at many sites. It's going to, it's going to sequester the material, and it's, going to, I, it's so much better than having this stuff in the river. Can't we can't control. wait to control. take it out of the river. Thank you. Um, do, do, excuse me. Excuse me. Do PCBs break down in the soil? If so, how long does it take? Not well. Not these kind of PCBs. No, they won't. They won't break down in the soil. The good thing is that they also won't travel as much in the water either. Um, unless they're, you know, in, they get stirred up in the water column and move, they're not going to, they're not going to come off the soil into the water as very, very readily. Are, are PCBs airborne? PCBs are um, can become airborne at really low levels. Um, it's a lot. It, it, the, the the PCB air issue is. A much bigger issue in the river and the floodplain right now than it would be. There would be no PCB area issue once the um, consolidation area is completed. How are you going to ensure that PCBs don't re-enter the environment? That is a good question. Um, so what we're putting, what uh, two things. One, the high levels are going off site. Um, so what we're putting, what the proposal is to put the material in Lee, it's going to be, even though the material is, uh, even though the material is, uh, 
do you want me to answer the question? Even though the, even though the um, material is um, at a low level such that we don't need these liners and caps, we're putting liners and caps in this location. Uh, is, is there a chance that some of the material will be removed by train rather than by truck? Yes. Um, who is going to set the parameters for defining the number and size of the samples? EPA. Uh, what what steps uh, do you anticipate will be taken uh, to protect uh, children who are waiting for school buses uh, from uh, the material that's being uh, hauled out of the rivers? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, f for, for us that we do not only um, environmental sites, but anyone that works on construction sites, big construction sites, that, that is a big issue, and it's not, it has nothing to do with the PCBs, it's the, we would worry about the trucks that are driving on the roads when kids are getting on the buses. You, you don't want to be running trucks at that time in the morning, you don't want to be running trucks in the afternoon when there's a lot of kids around, and you know, you just, it's, it's construction projects are dangerous, and we have to deal with that. That's one of the things that we deal with, that's why Considering rail might be a, might, it might be a much better option. We just have to figure out whether we can do it or not. What what steps? Can I answer that? I would be I would definitely be more worried about the trucks than what's in the trucks. Definitely, I have kids. I have kids. I have kids, and some of you know, I take this really seriously. All right, I grew up in Woburn, Massachusetts. Okay, I know some of you have heard this before, but this is, this is my background. I grew up next to a child, 13 years old. My next door neighbor died of leukemia from the water he was drinking in our town, the same water I was drinking. I take this very seriously. I take this very seriously, all right? I've been working for EPA for 30 years, and it's partly because of my background and what I went through when I was a kid. So please, li please, you don't, have to, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with our experts. But please know that we care about the children here. What, what, steps, what steps will be taken uh, to monitor? Let's, let's go back to that one. No. It hasn't been fully answered. What about okay. Avondale School Yard and Hill 78? Let's talk about that. I'll talk about that. If you'll stop talking for a second, maybe you can listen, and the other people in this room might want to hear something. Where's this projector? Okay, so let's talk. Mr. Cook talked about facts. Let's talk about facts. Let's talk about data. Let's talk about information that people can look at. Okay? I'm the project manager there. I've been watching Allendale School every day for 20 years. So you're not the only one who knows about Allendale School. I know about it. My kids, will you let me speak? How about you let me speak and other people in the room can ask me questions as follow-ups. I don't really care what you like. So this is what happened at Allendale School. When the consent decree started, in 1950, Allendale School was a swamp. City bought the land. 1950, people did a lot of things differently. They got fill from Hill 78 and placed it in the playground. 40,000 yards of contaminated soil. Part of the consent decree which Jerry Doyle pushed extremely hard was to remove all those PCBs from Allendale School. That was done. They were brought across the street. Yes, there's a consolidation area next to that. That's true. 
Would you rather have your kids walking on 40,000 yards of contaminated soil or have it under two feet of soil? I know what I would want my kids walking on. The other things, the other facts, the other facts. Allendale School, air monitoring, been going on for 20 years. The data's online, there's EPA risk levels online. There's the websites. If you want to look at them, the presentation will be online, you can look at facts. The results from the last one were about 25 times lower than EPA's long-term 30-year, uh, if you were exposed to it for 70 years. So the data is there, it's safe. The second fact, I'll, I'll get to the aquifers. First of all, I don't know any kids who swim in aquifers that are underground. So that's the first thing. So let's get back to some facts. Mass DPH. There was some operational issues at the, at the landfill. That's correct. We addressed them. The teachers were very aggressive. They were very good. They pushed us hard. They called in Mass DPH to do an extensive survey inside the school and outside the school. A lot of people were put on that work group, including HRI, me, science teachers at Allendale School, principal at Allendale School, the health department director at the time, Dr. Odama. They did a one-year study. The results are there. They did blood tests. They did wipe samples. They did everything. All the levels were consistent with background levels or normal levels across the country. You don't have to believe that, but if other people want to look at facts, the report is there. It's about an inch thick. I know you don't like facts because they don't support your conclusion, but other people might like facts. The other fact, Allendale school sampling. We collected that at the hottest days in the summer. We also collected stuff in a cemetery off in Great Barrington somewhere as a background. Exact same results. All right, those are facts. Sorry they don't fit into your narrative. Ellendale School has been sampled every year for the last 20 years, numerous times. If you want to look and get some information, or if other people want to look, more importantly, it's all there. As far as these aquifers, the groundwater, where these landfills were placed, it's on GE's facility, GE's manufacturing facility. Some of it started in 1903. It's been there a long time. 1900s, a lot of companies didn't do very well managing their waste. I think we all know that. Where these landfills are, like we said, Hill 78 was started probably in the 30s. What about the permits a lot of dumping was going on in the 30s. A lot of solvents, a lot of degreasers, a lot of very mobile chemicals. A lot of mobile chemicals were dumped. The groundwater where those landfills are, you want to call it an aquifer, groundwater, same thing. It was contaminated. It was contaminated before EPA got here. It was contaminated before most of us were born. That's a fact. The groundwater flows away from Allendale School. Brian talked about risk. Risk is a combination of exposure to contamination and the concentration of contamination. If you don't have exposure to underground groundwater, there's no risk. The groundwater is a risk to migrating to the Housatonic River, not to Allendale School. That's the facts on Allendale School. So the facts are there. If somebody wants to read the facts, see the blood results, see DPH's conclusion, the information is there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you please describe what sort of monitoring will occur once the uh, rest of the river cleanup has been completed and to ensure that any further mitigation that is necessary will occur? I'm assuming that's monitoring of any on-site consolidation area. Is that right, whoever asked that question? Yeah. So, so there'll be... Um, you know, again, we, ha we have a process to go through, but if, if that ends up being the end solution, we would have air monitoring around the, air, around the uh, that whole location. We'd have groundwater monitoring, both up gradient and down gradient. Um, and 
we would have, like have cap monitor. We'd have, we'd monitor the cap periodically over throughout the year to make sure that there's no erosion or things like that happening. So there's a significant amount of monitoring. There will be a plan to propose that as well, which people will be able to look at. But that's the basic monitoring that you'd have at every landfill. It's the same kind of monitoring that you have at the hundreds of municipal landfills across Massachusetts. So if it goes bad, it's easy on the hook to clean up. Yes. Sales. Yes. And we, and we also, um, we have, uh, and we said this at some of the other meetings, we have a $140 million surety bond in place right now to the extent that GE at some point can't afford to do this um, or they, you know, they go bankrupt or whatever. So that's something that we just put in place a couple of years ago as um, GE started to, their, their financial fortune started to look a little uh, less healthy. Uh, how far beyond the top of the riverbank will remediation take place? It, it depends on the area. Um, you know, where, where basically every spring the river floods, and especially upstream of Woods Pond, um, pretty much everywhere where you've seen it flood, there's a potential that there's PCBs there because the PCBs have gotten stirred up all the way up in Pittsfield, they make their way down. Right now they're not coming from Pittsfield because we did the first two miles, but over the last 75 years ago that's been happening. So it's been deposited on the floodplain. So if you see, where you see it's flooded a lot, those are places where there may be remediation, depending on the levels, but it's likely there are some PCBs there. Where the river doesn't flood, or floods very minimally, you probably won't go up over the banks at all in terms of the remediation. A number of questions of when, what's the anticipated start date and where will the uh, cleanup begin? As I said before, the start date for the investigations and starting to put together the studies and everything is, is now. One thing GE agreed to is not wait for the permit. They're taking a risk if the permit never goes through that they did this, uh, you know, on their own time, but I think it's the right thing to do and I'm glad they did it. Um, so we probably won't get, as I said, we won't get into the river for two to three years and then it's a, you know, a potentially 13 year process, but we're looking at ways to speed that up a lot if we can. Well, a number of questions about public input. Uh, where will the public be able to have uh, input on the um, on the plan and voice its its objections. So on the on the um, on our actual draft permit, when we put that out, we'll have a public hearing where people will be able to come and and you know we won't be there answering questions or anything. It'll just the only thing will be people giving their input. Um, at the public hearing and it'll be recorded and everything and that will be a way to put in public comments. You'll be able to do it online. Um, you'll be able to write letters to us. Um, basically, you know, almost any way you can think of getting us comments, but if they are verbal comments, it will have to be at the hearing and then written comments will be able to come in almost any form. Probably easiest for most of us to be able to submit um, comments um, online. That's one way, easy way to do it nowadays. But there are many, there'll be many different ways to do it. Will these comments actually have an impact? Yeah. The, it depends on what the comments are. Um, well, you know, we, we have some comments that will not help us make a different decision, but we have other comments that may, maybe we find out something we have no idea. We didn't know. That's why we do it, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, the comments do make a difference. I know they have in the past. Um, on pretty much every site I've ever worked on. So um, I encourage people to comment, whether it's to say you, you hate the dump or whether it's to say if you have the dump or if you're doing this, you should be doing this better or you're, you're coming through my neighborhood, I want to make sure you don't do X and Y. All that stuff will be important to us, not only in the permit decision but also going forward from that. Uh, can you tell us what parts of the canoe meadows will be used as a staging area? Uh, 
I don't think we know at this point. I'm, I'm looking at the Canoe Meadows people. I don't think we know. Maybe Dean can help a little bit. But Yeah, we don't know exactly where it is. However, assuming that it's going to be closer to the river where the contamination is, Mass Audubon worked with us to make sure that there's provisions that if the existing parking lot cannot be used, there'll be an alternate parking lot, alternate trails to get to the, um, the walkways and the areas that are away from where the remediation is. So, you know, again, nothing's been finalized, but it would be in the area more closer to where uh, the river is because that's where the contamination is. Uh, what is a safe level of PCB? It, it, as Dean said, the, the, um, the risk is the exposure times the concentration, or there's an equation, exposure and concentration. So just to give you an idea of what the federal rules say, um, if you're on a residential property used you know, for residential purposes, the, the, the safe level will be one part per million. If you're um, in a recreational property, and a lot of sites that I've dealt with, the safe level is 10 parts per million. And this is just, you know, some sites are lower and some sites are higher than others. Um, on industrial property, sort of low occupancy area, the safe level would be 25 parts per million. Um, and so, you know, the, the, it, it depends on how, like for example, the 25 parts per million assumes that someone's going to be exposed and, and, and don't quote me exactly on the numbers, but one hour a day for about 300 days a year um, for, for 30 years, I think. So that's, the, that's how the risk equation works and it comes out to either, you know, that's where the acceptable risk line is drawn. So there really is an actual equation. You can look on EPA's website, the risk assessment website, um, in the EPA Washington's website, and it lays out how we do our risk assessments, but it's basically the, the amount of days per year um, times certain hours per day, which is why the residential is different than an industrial. The industrial property, they assume, you know, someone's going to be going out and having their lunch, sitting on, the, sitting on the ground, having their lunch for an hour a day. On a residential property, they're considering that a kid could be out in the yard for eight hours a day for seven days a week times 30 years. So that's how these things are figured out. Again, PCBs are chronic, a chronic toxin, and we don't want it to accumulate over time. What are the levels? Are they going to be stored in the dock? The, the, the average levels, as we know right now, there's going to be 20,000 more samples taken in the river itself. But as we know right now, the levels are, the average levels, if you use the, the, the thousands of samples we already have, it's about 20 to, 20, 20 to 25 parts per million. But won't that be concentrated at the dump area? Par, par, no, well, it's so, parts per million is what you're exposed to. So if we, you know, if we had all those PCBs from that one million cubic yards in one location and you were exposed to that, yeah, then that's a different story. But this is, this, this is average concentrations that we know we're ta we've taken thousands of samples in the river. So we know when we put it in there, if someone was exposed, first of all, you're going to have a cap over it. But if someone was exposed, they're exposed to 20 to 25 parts per million. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing something like thermal desorption that we were talking about earlier, and you're putting a cover over the top of it and heating it up, then yeah, all those PCBs are going into one place in the air. And you, you're hopefully capturing those PCBs in the air and then destroying them. Isn't there a filter for that though? Right, that, well that's the, destruction I'm, that's, the, that's the destruction I'm talking about. Whether you, you usually heat them up and then that, once you, you try to destroy them there, there are filters, right? right? But we've, the reason why I say that is we've had questions of, well, what if, what if the cap leaks? It's a lot bigger deal when you're doing thermal desorption if it leaks as opposed to if you have a landfill. It's not an issue in a landfill as much. It's a big issue in some other technologies. Jane said she wants the landfill to be temporary, yeah. Um, and we all want... We, 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 
we want, we, we, let me just say, the, the, the innovative technology thing, we take that really seriously. Um, and we, you know, this isn't just about Berkshire County. If we can find a solution where you can, at these landfills, um, inject something, whether it be a biological thing or whether it be solvents or something that create, that are able to destroy the PCBs, that's going to help every community. In the, every community has PCBs in their municipal landfill. Every single one of them. Well, you, you'd be surprised. There's industrial waste in every single municipal landfill that I've ever dealt with. Many of our Superfund sites are actually municipal landfills. So, um, I lost my train of thought. What were you? Temporary landfill. Oh, temporary. temporary. Um, so, so we, we are going to put specific funds, EPA is committed. We, we thought it, this isn't a good thing for GE to run. We didn't think it w it's a good idea for them to be looking for the innovative technologies. We think it's our job, and again, we think it might help the rest of the country. So we're going to put significant amount of funds into research to look at specific technologies, specific to this site too, but it should help other sites as well. So we don't see a solution that is foolproof at this point. Um, but if we find one, it's going to be used at other places too. What's that? I'm not saying it's temporary. I'm not saying it's temporary. I'm saying we're going to build it as if it will last forever. Um,
we could put all the material in the in this the way this is built. This is built as if it's a chemical waste landfill. It is not going to be a chemical waste landfill because we're putting levels that are much lower than that in there, lower than 50. So I answered your question, Tim. You did. Why? Why don't you explain yourself then? Go ahead. Can you just say that there will be PCBs up to 50 parts per million in this dump? Yes. Okay, thank you. And the very next question are the actors. Are there some that's up in the area? Hold on, hold on. You know that. So why are they currently polluted? And why are they polluted? Where, where, which groundwater in Act are you talking about? Are you talking about down in Lee or in Pittsfield? Proposed dump site. You know, you could save a lot. Of yes, the answer is yes. Depending on how close to that land, there are two existing: one municipal landfill and one paper mill landfill that's in the same same area. So yes, there is, there is. And, and uh, me and the gentleman have talked before, there, there's definitely groundwater contamination coming out of at least one of those landfills because we see, I've seen pictures of it. Okay. Hold on, hold on. So, where, where are the out of state dump sites? Well, there are, there are, there are as I said before, there are hundreds of municipal landfills in Massachusetts that are all dump sites. If you ask the state of Massachusetts, they would say they all have higher levels of contamination in it than just trash. Oh, PCBs, I'm sorry. Well, the, the municipal landfills would have PCBs in them too, but they're not, um, those would be from industries that use PCBs. There, I'd say, you know, for Superfund sites, we, most of our sites are unlined. Um, because when we got there, there was, you know, the, the contamination already existed. So there were probably, I don't know, maybe 20 of them in Massachusetts that have PCBs in them. There are places like, well, I talked about Norwood PCBs. Sullivan's Ledge is a, is a big landfill in New Bedford that has lots of PCBs. That, that is unlined, but it has a pretty sophisticated cap on top to keep the water out of it. Um, New Bedford Harbor, obviously. Um, but there are, I'm trying to think if there are any others. I think that, what's it, commercial? So I think the question is, what are permitted out-of-state dump sites for PCBs? Out-of-state dump. Yeah. All right, you keep adding words. So out-of-state landfills, there are, I think a dozen of them, or, or 10 of them across the country. We've only seen GE use two of them, I think, from this site, two or three. Uh, one that's in one that's in New York that they don't use anymore. One that's in Michigan, just outside of Detroit, and one that's in Texas. But there are several others. There's one in California. The, you know, there's one in Utah, I think. But those are the ones that I've seen used. One in Nevada. I'm sure there's there's a lot of dumps in Nevada. So how are these? How are those uh, dump sites being monitored for health and safety? They would be, uh, again, we're not overseeing those, they're not in New England, but they would be monitored in a similar way to this, but they're commercial landfills, so they're having, you know, they're having material come in every single day. Some of it might be PCB waste, some of it might be solvent contaminated waste, they, they're having everything come into those places. So they, they, they um, you know, especially if the solvent's going in there, they're probably monitoring the air like we would do here. They're monitoring the groundwater. They have to monitor the groundwater around them. So it's pretty similar. But these are a lot bigger. Where is the PCB dump in Massachusetts that line? And where is it? We, we, we want names. And you said there's none that are lined. I don't think there's any that are lined in Massachusetts. But there are so lots, of, lots of PCB line. landfills that are unlined that have levels higher than what we're talking about here. The, the first, specifically for PCBs, we built Fort Devens, for example. We, I mean, we didn't build it. The Army built it. Um, the Army built a landfill that's lined there that does have PCBs in it, but the main contaminants are not PCBs in that landfill. Um, so that is one. But again, the, the, we're monitoring sites that have no liners that have higher levels than this. 
one other thing we already talked about is, has been brought up in Pittsfield. Part of the consent decree was to build a lined landfill. So there's another one. And that's lined, and that took the material over 50 parts per million. So if you want an example, there's one, and there's all the data for the abutting facility. Okay, so it's uh, getting on towards eight o'clock. So if uh, people would like to make some comments or ask some questions, please come up to the microphone. So everyone else, if they want to get in line to ask questions, we're happy to. My name is Maggie Katz. My question is, why does GE, who in 2019 made a profit of $103 billion, $103 billion in one year, why are they being allowed to cheap out? and get dump sites put locally when that was not what was supposed to happen. Why are they being allowed to be let off the hook? Why are they not being held responsible? 40 years, they have been not responsible. We've had enough of this kind of leadership which puts profit before people's health water, and safety. Why? $103 billion. Why did you say if GE might not be able to afford it? Why? If they went bankrupt, I said. Okay, well, it doesn't look like that's happening. And right now, they have the money. So I would like to know why they keep being let off the hook. Who are they threatening and scaring that this keeps happening? Hello, thank you so much for bringing that up. If GE decides to back out, we've been told that they're going to dismantle GE into smaller corporations so they can back out. I am coming to you as an environmental educator. I've spoken about leachate before. There is so much information about why these lined landfills do not work. And one of them, because I teach it to middle schoolers, and if you would like to come with me, and have an experiential education experience, we could try to build one. It's called erosion. The liners are there, all these incredible leachate pipes are there, and the ground shifts. As they're building the pile, they cannot cap it fast enough. We have extreme weather. Mother nature rules. We can, these dumps are not foolproof here, nor are they in Nevada, nor are they in Texas. It's not an answer. So, but we are in an area where we get a lot of rain. Do we get a lot of rain? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to be having this big PCB dump that's going to be built in stages, and it may or may not fail. Please do your research. Look online. The Hudson River advocates, activists, have given us told us that there's a, an article about that. In 2019, they said, be careful. GE is not going to do what they, want, what they say they're going to do. The New York is suing the EPA to force GE to continue to finish cleaning up. They've been dredging over there in the Hudson, and it's not been successful. It's just simple education. These people in HRI have really been doing a lot, and they're really frustrated. When you hear these people yelling, it's because they've forced things to happen at Allendale School and other areas. And if you want to read something, read the Beats position on Allendale School, and then read their newest position. They were not very trusting of GE back in Allendale. I did my own research on that. Those are articles that you can find on the paper and Jane is shaking her head. I do not fault any of these people. And I even like you, Gary. He's very <laughs> accessible. I'm gonna be taking some I'm, kids I'm to go, Brian, <laughs> sorry. I always calling you Gary. So Brian, I'm gonna be taking some youth to interview Brian and some other people. So, we are all being bullied by GE. We need to unify, educate, and come up with a plan. 
please look for HRI to have a position on this. They're getting, they're working very closely with their board and uh, an environmental lawyer, and they're going to be coming up with a proposal that's different than what we were bullied into here. I am not a homeowner in this area. I'm only coming to you as an educator. Thank you. There you go. So look. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to respond, but I, I will say, and I think Jane and I agree on this, it's, it's, it's trust, but verify. Uh, we, don't, we don't completely trust any of the, of the parties that we work with on these sites. We can't, you know, because they're, they're in a different position than us. Our job is to protect the public. Their job is to make money. So it's, it is really trust, but verify. Um, hello. Go ahead, Sage. Hi, I'm Sage Ratajkowski. I live in Lennoxdale, about a half a mile from where the dump is proposed to be, the dump that I don't think is gonna happen. And uh, I'm glad that tonight I got, I got Brian to tell me that thermal desorption could work. It is a reliable technology, it can be done right, and there are many companies that are doing it, actually, several in the US. And it's been done in other sites, and it can work. Um, I actually don't believe it could even it could even be less than the 400 million. But even if it is 400 million dollars more to do thermal desorption and have no dump, and could also not have the fact of shipping waste out to other sites across the nation too, because that's we don't want to ship it to Detroit. We don't want to put it near other people's neighborhoods either, you know. And we don't want to ship a million, a hundred thousand yards across the country using fossil fuels too. But so Wait, we don't want to either. Good, I know you don't. Um, General Electric has been brilliant, and they, they invented the light bulb. They invented, Thomas Edison invented the concept of the Industrial Research Laboratory. He invented uh, an invention machine, basically. And they invented radio, they invented the vacuum tube. They, and the list goes on and on, and they're still brilliant, and if you look at their turbines and their wind turbines and everything they're doing, including nuclear plants that I'm against, but they're, they're brilliant. They have had a, an industrial history where they have also been focused on the money, above all, for some, after a certain point, especially. And then there was a period of Jack Welch, who just died a few days ago, where he was a cutthroat for the money. He was called Neutron Jack, I think. And I mean, this is what it's about. It's like, they can be brilliant on this as well. They can be as brilliant on this as they are on their wind turbines, you know? Like they're building wind farms, they could also do the right thing and clean up their past, deal with their karma, because we're dealing with it right here. And if it's going to cost, you know, a hundred billion dollar company, four hundred million dollars extra to clean up for things that they did, crimes against humanity and nature in the past, I think they should do it. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. Hi, I'm a student, I live in Lenox, and I have first a comment and then a question. So correct me if I'm wrong, General Electric will be responsible for monitoring their own dump site. We, we will both be monitoring, and again, it's trust but verify, and EPA needs to verify every one of these, uh, these sites that we're dealing with. So we, we would be monitoring al alongside of them. Okay, follow-up question for that. How often do you monitor? That will be part of the plan. I mean, there are lots of, there's, again, there's going to be lots of design plans and everything put out that people will be able to comment on. But, um, you know, we could probably look back at some of the other landfills that we've dealt with, but we, we'll, I, I don't know exactly uh, what the, what the, uh, how, how often it will be. Not yet, anyway. We will know. And how do you monitor whether or not the waste is leaking into the groundwater? And if you find that it is, how are you going to be able to fix a liner that's under this giant mountain of PCBs? How that's that a great work? question. Um, so the first part of it is, um, well, there, there are a few things. One is the material that we're putting in there is in the river right now. Right, it's it's contaminated Not soil, as highly concentrated soil in one and place. sediments. Right, it's um, 
you know, there are PCBs going over Woodspawn Dam as we, as we talk right now, and we, that's why we want, all of us want to get it out of the river. Um, but the, when we think of leachate, um, when I think of leachate at least, I think of most of the sites that we deal with where companies, you know, put drums, tanks full of liquids into these landfills that we deal with, municipal landfills, whatever, they're 50 years old, and then they start leaking eventually, they rust out and leak. And that's the leachate that we normally find at these locations, really nasty, high levels of contaminants. The, what, what's gonna come out of this sediment is gonna be the water that was sitting in the bottom of the river with the sediment. So there may, it may be lightly contaminated with PCBs, but it's gonna be very low level. Even with that though, we're gonna have a liner and then if that liner fails, we'll have another liner underneath it, and in between those liners, we'll be able to detect whether something's there. Um, I agree with you, though. It's really hard to fix it if it's, you know, down 30 feet under the ground. So um, you want to make sure you do it right. Thank you. So, we, got so one we, have, here. I'm gonna, we have time for two more. I'll make statements. it quick. And this isn't to you guys. This is to you out here. Very important that you continue up this pressure. My um, initial foray into this was living next to the Allendale schoolyard, and I was told that the school didn't have anything in it, and, and it, it, it end up did. I wanna make very clear, you have to be very careful of, of dumps. You have to be careful of, of incineration. They had an incinerator, a thermal incinerator, high, high heat, that was burning PCBs that, Brian, you weren't a part of this, but previous EPA gave them the permit to do this. And they ended up having to burn the PCBs from the groundwater under the industrial site, which some estimates were 70 to 80 million gallons that were in the groundwater, if you can wrap your head around that number. And this incinerator ended up, after a while, <clears throat> incinerators gotta burn at a certain level and they have to always have product and keep on burning so they're efficient. And we started taking less oil out of the groundwater, so they started getting PCBs from all around the country to burn at this incinerator. This was the biggest travesty to the people of Pittsfield. Here you got a technology that you think is taking care of the oil that was in the groundwater. And it ends up being a big money-making situation for them. When you burn PCBs at high levels, it ends up creating dioxins and furons, which are much more, much more toxic than PCBs. My point is, the river has been sacrificed, as I said. You sacrificed aquifers. Glacial aquifers have been sacrificed. And stop me if I'm wrong. You've sacrificed the IG zone, the biggest industrial zone in the county has been laid to rest. You sacrificed lives living with this stuff. People worked with this stuff, and there's a lot of cancer research that says these things are very toxic. They're in every one of your bodies if you took a blood serum level. Everyone on the planet has PCBs in them. The release from the environment now, or to the environment from the river, is what they're worried about, is what I believe. Because yearly, these PCBs get suspended, and they percolate on riverbeds, and they get released into the air. They get released over the Woods Pond Dam, over the Housatonic Dam at Rising Pond. It's a continual release. People who live next to the river are absorbing PCBs. I don't want, you know, when I used to complain about the PCB level contamination in, around the schoolyard and the industrial site, they said, you can't, you can't get crazy about this stuff because you'll redline the whole city. And we'll have to evacuate the whole city. Well, the fact is, the riverbed is so full of PCBs that it's pretty much a dump. 
There's, there is no river in the world that's more polluted with PCBs, the upper Housatonic. And that's documented. It's one of the most documented rivers in the world. So wrap your head around what they're worried about and what we're releasing into the environment. And you're going to tell me, with all the deception that we've been left to deal with through these years, again, the thermal oxidizer, the incinerator, them telling me there's not a problem with the Allendale schoolyard, when indeed you went in and had to dig up the whole thing up to 30, 40 feet. And, and the gentleman said there was just PCB oil, a little bit of dirt and, and fill. There were barrels. There were acres of barrels. Thank you you, you need you, to be very careful of what these gentlemen tell you. you. And what I'm going to tell you is this is only a preview. You've come along a working class town like Lee, where people aren't going to put up with this. People were, they were beat down in Pittsfield pretty okay. damn good. Thank you. And Thank you for your time. And I don't think Lee's going to stand up to this. And Thank I don't you. think the towns going along the river no. so, as we go along are going to go with so, this. So I'm just telling you, be ready. There hasn't been any civil disobedience, but I'm going to say this is the time where it might okay. happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. Okay. So we, we've run out of time. I want to thank everybody. Hold on. For, I'd really like to ask one brief question. One brief question. No. To Brian, I would very much appreciate it. It's, it's a useful and very I, practical. I will also, just so you know, I will stand outside and answer any questions anyone great. has. So. I think it would be great for everyone here to hear, because I've been at all three of these meetings, and you've been sharing a lot of information. At the Great Barrington meeting, at one point, you pointed out that the cost to ship these, uh, the, the, the sludge out of state would cost, is it ballpark, $600 million. And then you said the cost to actually put it and keep and create our own Superfund site here in Lenox, the cost was 550 million. And so the discrepancy from what I heard you say was $50 million between shipping it out for GE or keeping it here. Is that correct? It's the, so it was about $200 million extra to ship it off site. There's about $70 million in additional remediation as part of this agreement. And this, and this 70 or 60 whatever million dollars of economic incentives to the towns, that's not part of the cleanup. So it's not just the 70. Um, so, so, so we would they, actually the, say maybe 300 million extra for them to ship it out. 200, 210 200, million, yeah. And they might save because they won't be buying They're out gonna, all the towns. So our, our, our estimate, just, just to be clear, I want to be totally open with this. We think that it's going to cost them probably $70 million less, this agreement, than shipping it off-site, all of it off-site. And, and, and just to be clear, from the beginning, at the beginning of the presentation, we were put in a position to have to negotiate because we were told by our court that you might lose it all, basically. You're, you're, you're not justifying it well enough. So that, that's the position we're in. It's not like, I mean, if I could just pick, or if GE could just say, oh, we'll do it, we would do it in a second. But So Brian, okay. you've been at all these meetings. My, my question to you, as you've been understanding GE's position, why are they futzing over $70 million? This is like pennies to them. <coughs> what, what, is their, what is the obstruction in their thinking? What's going on over there that yeah. makes it so resistant to this idea? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it, you'll it have to ask them it does, that. It doesn't I, you'll make have to sense. Ask them Seventy that. million dollars. They, they they waste that like every day doing some experiment. Right. Do you have a sense of why they are so entrenched against? I I had a sense the, before why they didn't want to ship all of it offsite, yeah. and that sense was they would rather spend the money on the cleanup. So I would have rather, frankly, had them put the two hundred million dollars into the cleanup if we were gonna do what we're doing, but as part of the negotiation, we can only go so far with that. We're not, you know, we're not, we... So we, you don't, we, they we, don't have a really good reason. It we're could just in a be position dumb to thinking. have a lot of legal risk, so that's what we're dealing with. So we're, so, so you and, and the secret so, closed so, environment mediated thank, so, meeting. Thank you, you asked I, again, questions. I will be outside to answer anyone's questions that you have. So, okay, if you want to answer, uh -huh. I, I think it's very important for everybody so, to hear the questions and answers. So. 
but we're, so there will be plenty of opportunities in the future to have questions and public comments. But we committed to two hours. We're over that limit. And so we're going to end. You didn't let us speak, though. So we're going to end this meeting now. You spoke for two and, and a half. You spoke for two hours. I really you. think you owe it to the man who's going to live next to the mess that you're making to answer his question in front of this time. room. We're going to be compiling the questions. But you're not answering them. Can I have them back and give them back to the people? No. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Take care.